Pushing the limits of the game and watch. Is that a thing I can do with these things? I'm gonna give it a go. Yes, the Game & Watch series, those little handheld games from the 80s, Nintendo's first voyage into the new world of gaming on the move. A territory they have of course dominated ever since, but this was their first to go around with games that go in your pocket. And I'm going to break out of the usual confines of games that push the limits and take a look at some games that did the most within what was a very confined medium indeed. And yes, I've got to say that this has turned into more of a history of the game and watch rather than strictly sticking with the concept of pushing the limits, but I think that maybe works better in this corner of gaming lore. I've also ended up splitting it into two parts to prevent things getting a bit unwieldy. In this first part, I'm dealing with what I'm calling the classic era from the conception of the series going up to about the year 1984, dividing it at this point for reasons that will become clear later. So let's get ready to go back to the dawn of mobile gaming. But just before I do, let's talk about something that is not the dawn, but the blazing midday sun of mobile gaming, because this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Yes, you might have heard of it, one or two other YouTubers may have mentioned it. The biggest, the best, the most visually stunning mobile dark fantasy RPG in the world. There's a link in the description, why not download it right now? I can promise you it will cost you less than a mint in box game and watch because it's free to download and to be fair it's probably going to keep you occupied a bit longer too than what was state of the art in 1981. You know what I like about Raid is just how darn good it looks and not just for a mobile game it really does look fabulous. I love the character portraits, I love the character animations, I love the models and it sounds fantastic too. It's also not just playable on iOS and Android, but on PC too. There's a PC client so you can log in whilst you're at your desk and play Raid whilst you should be doing something more productive. Which is good because there's always something happening in Raid. And this month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including a jam-packed Halloween lineup around Halloween. Big rewards, tournaments, special fragment events to get some brand new legendary champions including one very spooky Halloween champion, all that kind of stuff. Raids bigger, busier, bustier, ballsier and better than ever and there are some giant updates coming very soon. In fact, there's never been a better time to get started. If you do want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll get an epic hero, Chinoru, who is amazing in the Doom Tower, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. And all this treasure will be waiting for you right here, but these rewards are available only for the next 30 days and only for new players. So download Raid Shadow Legends from the link in the description right now to get raiding folks and I'll see you in game. Ok, we're back in the room and let's start the Game & Watch journey where it all began with the simply titled Ball. The brainchild of the late great Nintendo engineer Gunpei Yokoi. According to legend, the billion dollar idea struck him whilst on a bullet train, where he saw a businessman amusing himself by fiddling idly with a pocket calculator. Maybe he could come up with something slightly more fun, but based on the same technology. After getting the nod from his superiors, work began on what was to be a range of games, the first being Ball Here, launched in April 1980, with another four titles following that year, in what's become known as the Silver Line. These weren't the first handheld games, Mattel can probably claim credit for that, but they were innovative and different from anything then on the market. Based on LCD displays, they were small, sleek, light and able to run for a heck of a long time on two button cells. Their design showed a lot of what would become Nintendo's characteristic attention to detail in the world of gaming, but most of all they were fun. If you think messing around with a calculator's good, you should try playing with our balls. That wasn't Nintendo's slogan, but it should have been. 
The silver minimalist design and the addition of clock functionality betrays their origin in the world of business though. To start with, these seem to have been designed more like gadgets or executive toys rather than traditional toys aimed at kids. Game and Watch is probably a bit of a misnomer, strictly speaking, but Game and Clock would describe it well enough. A fun thing to keep on your desk. The first five games were all, of course, dead simple, limited to one single mechanic, but this was part of their charm, a pick-up-and-play time waster that anyone could dive into in an idle moment. They would evolve over the coming years, but it was this that was the foundation of the Game & Watch line, accessible gaming gadgets. But where can you go from here? Well, 1981 saw two more iterations of the family. First up are three games in what's been called the Gold Line. These added a touch of colour to the screen. Now, in the actual active LCD part of the screen, technology of the time didn't allow for that, but in the printed background graphics. Something that seems to mark a bit of a change in direction of the game and watch into a more toy-like feel and a bit less like a purely high-tech gadget. This was continued with the launch of the widescreen range the same year. Even more colour printing in the background, a wider aspect ratio, and some maybe slightly more complex, more gamey mechanics. The kid appeal must already have been huge, and this was solidified with some licensed tie-ins too, with Popeye, Mickey Mouse and Snoopy all popping up in handheld form. They also upped the clock functionality with the addition of an alarm, a genuinely useful feature in the days before smart anythings. It is, though, hard to get away from just how primitive these games seem now. Even by the standards of the time, they were stripped back to the barest elements. They're about as simple as it's possible to be, while still being able to be called a video game. But of course, the technology behind them isn't quite so basic. So what is it that's in the guts of these things? Well, for a long time, Game & Watch games were assumed to be what are called finite state machines, based around custom-made chips. Not really computers, no CPU, no ROM, no program code per se, just simple devices with a set of functions hardwired into them. They could be simulated on another computer, but not emulated. Not if there's no CPU to emulate or no ROM code to run. This wasn't a bad guess. Many early electronic games were like this, handheld or even arcade cabinet, breakout included, but this turned out not to be true. Thanks to some dedicated hackers in the MAME project, the innards of the game and watch have been revealed. The full story you can read about in Retro Gamer magazine number 222, but it turns out these games are all based on sharp 4-bit microcontrollers. Yeah, calling these games 4-bit is not just a turn of phrase, they're running on tiny, cheap, low-powered 4-bit CPUs. A step back from the 8-bit CPUs common at the time, in fact, miniaturised versions of the very first all-in-one CPUs that were launched in the early 70s. All these first few Game & Watch games have in their hearts a sharp SM5A with 65 4-bit words of RAM, up to 1.8 kilobytes of ROM, a beeper, and an LCD display driver which can handle up to 72 LCD segments, these being the bits in the display that turn on and off. It may not sound like much, but the ROM size is more than you might expect. Early Atari 2600 games were 2 kilobytes in size. They do seem to be using that much too, looking at some thrilling memory dumps, but I suppose on top of the game you've got the watch part to deal with too, which needs to fit in the same space. What is surprising is just how slow this chip runs. 16 kilohertz. Yes, that's kilohertz with a K, which does sound ridiculously slow. Could that be right? Well, it seems to be from what I've read, but that is less than a hundredth of the clock speed of many 8-bit systems of the day. But I suppose this just underlines the genius of the Game & Watch. These chips were cheap and readily available, designed for clocks and calculators and the like, but leveraged here into something much more fun with some ingenuity. 
16 kilohertz must have been enough. This little microcontroller was the right tool for the job, wasn't it? It did what it needed to do, and the Game & Watch line was a huge success. Nintendo weren't going to let the grass grow beneath their feet though. Tons of copycat competitors were flooding the market within months, and Nintendo needed to keep innovating to keep selling. And that they did, with what turns out to be another billion dollar idea. Well, actually two. Introducing Donkey Kong Game & Watch Edition. Yes, this was Nintendo's first arcade hit, a game that put them on the map worldwide, and a handheld port was an obvious winner. Gunpei Yokoi once again knocked it out of the park, introducing both the D-pad, soon to be the default standard in console game controls, and the dual screen clamshell design, the shape of the future. As for the game itself, well, Nintendo were confident enough to shift away from attempting to remain fully faithful to the arcade, and instead came up with a simplified platform style game with a Donkey Kong theme. It looked good and it was fun to play in its limited capacity. Interestingly, this was not the only portable Donkey Kong conversion. Coleco had their own version too, one that, well, it looks the part, and it is closer to the arcade, but maybe not quite as stylish as the Nintendo version or as fun to play. Donkey Kong was actually not the first dual screen game. Oil Panic beat it out the gate by three days, but both of them were made possible by a slight upgrade to the chip that powered them. These games both made use of the Sharp SM510, which offered a larger ROM size, now a massive 2.7K, 128 4-bit words of RAM, and a driver that could handle 128 LCD segments. OK, it's still incredibly weak, but more storage space and more LCD segments meant more complex, larger games like Donkey Kong and its very nicely done sequel, the unsurprisingly named Donkey Kong 2. And it wasn't just dual screen games that benefited from this. Later widescreen games like Donkey Kong Jr. and Snoopy Tennis also made use of this little bit of extra power. Where to next for Nintendo? Well, horizontal multi-screen games were an obvious next step, and this version of Mario Bros. might have been the best of them, though it bears no resemblance at all to the arcade game of the same name that came out that same year. Apparently it was a huge seller, but Nintendo had an even better plan than two screens, or so it must have seemed. It was time to bring out the colour. Launched in 1983 was the Tabletop series, which brought handheld gaming in a more colourful but, well, less handheld format. In fact, calling these Game & Watch is really taking liberties. They did sell the time, but unless you're Flavor Flav, these aren't watches. Though despite their large size, they are really cut from the same cloth and still have the Game & Watch branding. All of the games featured in this tabletop line were brand new, they weren't just colourised versions of existing games, including an all new Donkey Kong Jr. Some handheld games injected colour with the use of LEDs or vacuum fluorescent displays, tiny glowing vacuum tubes, but both of these tended to be very bulky and power hungry. Nintendo's solution? Well, the same little LCD displays that they were already using, coated in coloured plastic film and lit from behind with natural ambient light. It worked well if it was set up just right, though this emulated footage here doesn't quite show exactly how it looks in the flesh. Popping up the same year with the Panorama screen games, essentially the same idea as the tabletops but in a smaller form, though still hardly pocket sized. Three of the Panorama series were repacked tabletop games, but three of them were brand new, although not straying that far from the formula already laid out. All of these games benefited from another slight upgrade in the chip that drove them, this time making use of the SM511. This was blessed with an embarrassingly large 4KB ROM size with up to 136 LCD segments on the screen, and not only that, they enjoyed the addition of the melody circuit. This offered a bit of a sound upgrade, allowing the system to play short tunes. All the tabletop and panorama games have these slightly more tuneful bleeps, including Mario's Bombs Away here. 
A forgotten chapter of Mario lore, this one, the military years, never subsequently mentioned in any Mario game that I can recall, maybe he doesn't like to talk about it. Except for when you turn into that tank in Mario, Odyssey maybe is supposed to be some sort of manifestation of PTSD, Mario's dark past, but well, let's not get bogged down in that now. Also using the raw blistering power of the SM511 was the Micro Versus system, the next wave of Nintendo's gaming on the go empire, featuring two player action with some dinky little wired controllers attached. The NES, or Family Computer as it was still known at this point, had been out for a year and its arcade version known as the Versus system had just launched too and it seems like this little system combined elements of both. It's an interesting concept and if you really squint you might even be able to see some family resemblance to the Switch. I don't think anyone would call these games the best the Game & Watch has to offer, but you probably couldn't even call them Game & Watch, the branding being dropped for these machines. They are though, I think, a chapter in Nintendo's history that does deserve some recognition. I'm not sure how well either of the colour games or the Versus systems did sales-wise, but Nintendo seemed to ditch both ideas pretty quickly and go back to making games that mostly stuck to the original form factor in the future. Neither of these two lines lasted longer than a year and the Game & Watch went straight back to its roots soon after. Published sales figures are very vague, but I would guess these weren't quite the success that Nintendo had hoped for. By this point, Nintendo were working hard on new projects, not least the NES that would really give them worldwide fame. It wouldn't have been a huge surprise if Nintendo dropped the series entirely, but the Game & Watch definitely did have a future at this point, even if it would no longer be their biggest seller. In fact, it would go on to last another seven years, even if the rate of releases would drop, but things would certainly change. Game & Watch games were due to become quite a bit more sophisticated. Actually, this was a trend that started before the launch of the Versus system with Spitball Sparky here from 1984, the first in a line of games that added more complex game mechanics. Games with progression, games with levels, games with more than just simple repetition. Yeah, okay, this is a variation on Breakout, a game that had already seen handheld versions from other manufacturers, but this has more going on. This isn't just the same loop over and over again, we have some differentiation, we have some identifiable levels, we even have a difficulty curve that isn't just about the game getting faster and faster. There's enough complexity here to start to put this on the level of some home console games. Early home console games, Atari 2600 type stuff, but a step up from previous Game & Watch titles. You could say the same thing about Crab Grab too, not the most enticing name, but after Spitball Sparky, the second and final entry in the Super Color range. Like its predecessor, it's got a bit more going on, an action puzzle game with a fair amount of longevity before it gets too repetitive. Again, it's got differentiated levels and a difficulty curve. These Super Color games were in a different form than anything that came before, a different aspect ratio and colour added with some plastic film stuck to the screen, but nothing as fussy as the tabletop or the panorama games. If anything, these bring to mind the original Silverline games, and I have to wonder if Nintendo were trying to court a more adult market once again alongside the clearly more kid-focused, colourful games they were promoting the same year. Oddly, both these actually use the same SM510 chips as the older pre-tabletop games, despite being the most complex games in the whole series to date. I think we might be getting onto some genuine limit pushing here, quite a lot being crammed into less than 3 kilobytes. This was the same hardware as games like Turtle Bridge from a couple of years previously, but with more gaming meat on the bone. These two titles might not have had the same instant kid appeal, but they've got a bit more to chew on if you're a gamer. 1983 and 1984 were big years for the Game & Watch, but 1985, moving forward, was very quiet. 
Just two releases saw the light of day. Tropical Fish, which might well have been a holdover from a few years earlier. It was very much in that style. And, strangely, Blackjack. Just Blackjack, that was the title. This one, well, it's a bit odd for a game and watch, at least in subject matter, but maybe it was a herald of what was to come. Yes, I'm going to call this the end of the classic game and watch era. 1985 seems like a good cutoff point. Probably the best known, best remembered, most iconic game and watches all came out in this period. The groundbreaking Silver Series, the massive selling Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers, the Disney tie-ins. They're not all necessarily the rarest or most desirable to collectors, but they are the ones that I'm sure most people think of when they think of the game and watch. From here on out, things got a bit weirder, a bit more experimental and a whole lot more ambitious. The crazy later years of the Game & Watch and the weird and wonderful ways that Nintendo pushed them forward will be the subject of part two of this series. That's on its way, but for now I'm going to take a bow and say this is the end. Thank you as always to my patrons, your help makes a huge difference. If you'd like to join them, that would be great. There's a link below alongside that Raid Shadow Legends link. Is it too late to say this now? Well, maybe, but if you have enjoyed that video, please do hit that like button. And if you haven't already, well, do hit that subscribe button as well if you'd like to see more of this type of thing. And I'm going to say thanks for watching, folks. Thanks for getting this far, and I'll see you next time.